Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this second part of the video, we're going to look at properties of the definite integral. So we still had one more objective that we needed to talk about, and it was properties of definite integrals that we can use to find the area under the curve bounded by the x-axis. So let's start with the properties of definite integral. Remember that the definite integral is represented as an elongated s for the integral sign. The a was the lower limit of integration, b was the upper limit of integration. f of x is called the integrand, so that is the function that has the area bounded by. And then dx is the differential, and the x is representing the variable of integration. We implicitly assume that a is less than b when we wrote the definition of a definite integral, where a was the lower limit, and b was the upper limit of integration. However, if we notice that we reverse this order of integration, let's say instead of a being the lower limit, it becomes the upper limit, and b was the upper limit, and it becomes the lower limit. So this a and b will be reversed. This is called reversing the order of integration. Then the width of the subintervals would be delta x was b minus a divided by n, but this is equal to the opposite of a subtract b. So if you factor out a negative from the numerator, these are equivalent. So the numerator is a minus b. That would be the length of the interval if you were starting at x equals b and going to x equals a instead. The denominator is still the same. It's just you introduce a negative sign. So the definite integral becomes our first integral property, and this is called reversing the order of integration. So the property says, if you have the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b, f of x dx, it is equal to the opposite sign of the definite integral from b to a, f of x dx. So if you reverse the order of integration, you introduce an opposite sign for the definite integral. So that's the first property. The second property comes from the same idea behind the width of the intervals. If a equals b, so that means your lower limit of integration is identical as the upper limit, then the width of the interval is zero. So that means every single area of the approximation rectangle will be zero on this closed interval a to b. So your integral will have a value also of zero because you're adding up zero for the area of the approximation rectangles. So area from a to a or area from b to b, f of x dx, would still be zero. And this would be zero width interval. So if you have a zero width, then the area representing by the definite integral is always zero. So now we can develop some additional basic properties of integration that we can use to help us evaluate integrals more easily. So these are the properties of integration, the definite integral. If you have the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b of a constant, and we did this in the previous video, where the variable integration is x, then it's always, you keep the coefficient, or just the constant, c, and it's multiplied by the length of the interval, b minus a. The second property says, if you have several terms, you can divide them up into their own definite integral using the same limits of integration. So integral from a to b, f of x, plus g of x, dx, is the integral from a to b, f of x, each integral has a variable of integration, so dx on the first integral for the first term, and then the second term gets its own integral from x equals a to x equals b, g of x, and it also has dx. The integrand is always between the integral sign and dx, or dt, or du, depends on the variable of integration. The third property says if you have a coefficient times a function as part of the integrand, the coefficient can be factored out because remember that the integral sign is representing a sum. So you can factor out the c from the sum of the approximation rectangles or the definite integral sign. And then you can find the area from x equals a to b of f of x dx and multiply by c. 
And then four is just an extension number two. It's just instead of an addition sign, it follows the same if it was a subtraction. You keep the sign between the terms and you keep the same sign between the two definite integrals. So these are four basic integral properties combined with the two that we just discussed earlier. We have six properties so far. So we have the zero width interval property. If you have the integral from A to A, the area will give you zero or the integral gives you zero. If you have a constant multiple times a function, so you can find the area underneath the function and the x bounded by the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. If the constant was two, then you can just multiply the area of f of x times two to get the area under two times f of x. And then the third one is for the sum property, which is number two. If you find out the area underneath f and you find out the area underneath g, then if you add those two areas together, you'll get the area underneath f plus g, which is all of that. Okay, and then number five, the fifth property, basic property of definite integration we're going to talk about is how do you take integrals and combine them when you're involving the same function over adjacent intervals? And this is called the additivity rule. So this is saying you have the integral from x equals a to x equals b of f of x, and then you have another area from x equals b to x equals c. So it's like the first integral stop the area at x equals b for the same function. And the second integral starting the area at x equals b and going up to x equals c, same function. Then you can just add those two integrals and combine them into one single integral from x equals a to x equals c of the same function. So this figure illustrates the additivity rule. Your area from x equals a to x equals b that's this definite integral. And then the area from x equals b to x equals c is this definite integral. Well, you can combine those areas by adding to get the area from x equals a to x equals c of the same function, f of x. All right, so with all these integral properties in mind, let's try example four. We're going to use the properties of definite integrals and the values of the following definite integrals to find the value of each of the following integrals. So number one, let's find the value of the definite integral from four to four, f of x dx. This is the zero width property. Your area is from x equals four to x equals four. There is no width. So this area would be zero or this definite integral would be equal to zero. And the reason zero width interval. So that's an easy property. Number two, let's say we have the definite integral from four to one f of x dx. So these three integrals at the top are given. These are given values for us to use. So the closest integral that I see is the integral from one to four f of x dx. We have integral from four to one. Well, this can be rewritten by reversing the order of integration by introducing an opposite sign or negative. So x equals one to four by reversing the order of integration. Keep the integrals or keep the integrands. And then also the variable integration is x. So now you can replace the integral from one to four f of x dx with negative two. So this is the opposite of negative two or positive two. And this was using the reversal of order of integration. Number three, integral from negative one to one, three times f of x, subtract five times g of x, and then dx. So this problem, we're gonna use several properties of definite integrals. Notice first that you have two terms with two different functions, three times f of x and five times g of x separated by a minus sign, so these can be rewritten into two separate definite integrals. So negative one to one, keep the same limits of integration on both integrals. Three times f of x dx minus integral from negative one to one, five times g of x dx. So you're not replacing f of x with five, you're replacing the entire integral with five. 
if the integrand is just f of x? Well, there's a 3. Keep in mind that coefficients times the function can be factored out from the integral. Same thing with 5. That can be factored out from that second integral. So this is equal to 3 times the integral from negative 1 to 1, f of x dx, minus 5 times the integral from negative 1 to 1, g of x dx. So now you can replace the value of the function because the integrand is f of x, and the limits of integration are negative 1 and 1. So this first integral is equal to 5, so 3 times 5, minus 5 times the other integral is for the function g of x from negative 1 to 1, it's 7. So 15 subtract 35, the value of this definite integral is negative 20. Okay, let's try number 4. This time we're looking at the integral from negative 1 to 4, f of x dx. Again, we can only use these three integrals at the top or any of our previous work. We have the integral from x equals negative 1 to x equals 4. Well, notice that we have the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x and the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x. So this is using the additivity rule. So negative 1 to 1, f of x dx, area can be added with the area from 1 to 4, f of x dx. So this is 5 plus negative 2, which is 3. And this is using the additivity rule. Okay, one more, number 5. Let's look at the integral from negative 1 to 1 of negative 3 times g of x plus 4. That's the integrand, and then the variable of integration is x. So again, this will use several of the integration properties. Notice that there's a plus between the two terms, so break this up into two different definite integrals. Negative 3 times g of x dx plus integral from negative 1 to 1, and then the integra second integrand is just 4, and then dx. So then that's the sum rule. So now you can take the negative 3 and factor it out from the integral. So it can be taken out in the front of the integral sign. So negative 3 integral from negative 1 to 1, g of x dx, plus integral from negative 1 to 1 of 4 dx. So, so far we've used two properties, but we had one property that we haven't used yet, and it's for this second integral. If you have the integral, definite integral of a constant, or just a coefficient 4, then you can find out its area using the first property from the previous page. So, the negative 3, integral from negative 1 to 1 of g of x was 7, so negative 3 times 7, and then plus 4 times the length of the interval, which is 1 subtract negative 1. So this is negative 21 plus 8, which is equal to negative 13. So the properties that we used in this problem were the sum and difference rule. We used the coefficient. taken outside the integral sign. Which was the same as number three. So these five problems give you an idea of how to use the basic integral properties for definite integrals. We had the zero width, we had reversal of integration, we had the sum and difference rules, we had that you can take a coefficient outside the integral sign, and we also have the additivity rule, and we also had the coefficient is just the integrand. So now we're going to look at a little bit more in terms of properties of integration. These are called the comparison properties. They compare the sizes of functions and the values of their definite integrals. If the function is greater than or equal to zero, that means the function is above the x-axis always on this interval from x equals a to x equals b, then your area that's represented by the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b, f of x dx, this is going to be at least 0, greater than or equal to 0. So if your function is on the x-axis or above the x-axis, 
then the value of the definite integral is zero or positive. Number seven, this is what's called the comparison theorem. If you have f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, so f of x, the y values are always greater than the y values of g of x. On this interval from x equals a to x equals b, then the value of the integral from x equals a to b of f of x dx must be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b g of x dx. So that means if the y values of f of x are greater than the y values of g of x, then your approximation rectangles will have a greater height. So your area under f of x will be the greater than the area under g of x. That makes sense. And in number eight, we're going to use in the next example, if m, lowercase m, is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to capital M, for x values on this closed interval a to b, then you can bound or find restrictions on how large the definite integral can be or how small it can be using the lowercase m and capital M. So it's m, lowercase m, times the length of the interval, b minus a, is less than or equal to the definite integral from a to b, f of x dx, which is still less than or equal to capital M times b minus a. So these first two properties that we talked about, they are intuitive. They state that if a function is greater than another function on a closed interval, then the greater area will be with the larger function on that same interval. So these two properties are called domination properties because you're comparing two integral values based on the value of the functions. So let's look at the graphs. So this is called the domination property. If f of x is greater than g of x, and you can see that with the graph, the y values of f of x are above the y values of g of x, then the area underneath f of x is going to be greater than the area underneath g of x and bounded by the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. What we haven't talked about yet is this property number eight. This is called the minimum maximum inequality because it's giving you an inequality for how large the definite integral value can be and how small it can be. So the last property involving the area under the curve or graph of f of x is saying it's greater than the area of the rectangle with a height lowercase m and it's less than the area is less than the area of the rectangle with the height capital M. So let's look at the diagram or the graph. The function f of x is this function that's in blue. The area underneath the graph would be this region. It is greater than the area from x equals a to x equals b of this rectangle where the height is the absolute minimum. So this lowercase, lowercase m is repre representing the absolute minimum y value for f of x. So if you take the smallest y value on the entire interval for f of x, as the height and b minus a is the width, the area will be larger than that area of that rectangle. And on the same idea, capital M represents the absolute maximum. So the largest y value on that interval for f of x. So if you look at that rectangle area, so the height of the rectangle is determined by the maximum y value for the function on that interval and it's multiplied by b minus a, then the area underneath f of x cannot be any more than the area of this rectangle, capital M times b minus a. That's called the maximum minimum inequality. So we're gonna use that in example five. Use the maximum minimum inequality to estimate the value of the definite integral so it's the integral from x equals zero to x equals one e to the negative x squared dx. Now this integral is not easily found. The value of that integral, you have to use calculus two methods to find its value. So since f of x is our function e to the negative x squared, then we can find its derivative by using the chain rule, negative two x e to the negative x squared, and if we find the critical values, 
set the derivative equal to 0, which gives us negative 2x e to negative x squared equals 0. Well, the exponential function will never equal 0 because it's always positive. It's above the x-axis. So this means x must be equal to 0. And this is our only critical number for the function f of x. So we can use the first derivative test to identify what is the function f of x doing on either side of x equals 0. So make a sign chart. This is representing f prime of x. We only had x equals 0 as the only critical number. So choose a test value on the left side of 0. Choose a test value on the right side of 0. Substitute these values into the derivative. And you'll find out that f prime of negative 1 is positive. So that means the original function, f of x, is increasing. And f prime of 1 is negative. So the function is decreasing. Well, we are only interested in what's happening from x equals 0 to 1. So on that interval, the function f of x is decreasing. And notice that it's also continuous on that same interval. So that means the function is integrable, so you can find its area. But notice, since the function is decreasing only from 0 to 1 for the x values, the absolute maximum occurs at the left endpoint of your closed interval, which would be x equals 1, x equals 0. And the absolute minimum occurs at the right endpoint, which is x equals 1. So to figure out how to use the maximum minimum inequality, we need to find the absolute max and absolute minimum values for this function. So capital M is the absolute max. It is at f of 0. So e to the opposite of 0 squared. So this will give us 1. So the absolute maximum is 1. And the absolute minimum is when x equals 1. So it's e to negative 1 squared. So e to negative first power, or 1 divided by e, is the absolute minimum. So now we can use the maximum minimum inequality to find bounds on how large and how small or provide an estimate for this integral. So lowercase m times b minus a is less than or equal to the definite integral from a to b f of x dx, which is less than or equal to capital M times b minus a. Okay, so we substitute everything in. Lowercase m is 1 divided by e times the length of the interval was 1. So 1 divided by e times 1 minus 0, less than or equal to the definite integral from 0 to 1, e to negative x squared dx, is less than or equal to, capital M is the absolute max, which is 1, times the length of the interval, 1 minus 0. So this tells us that 1 divided by e times 1 is about 0.367, and the integral from 0 to 1 e to negative x squared dx is greater than 0.367, but it's no more than 1. So this gives us bounds on how small and how large the integral for e to negative x squared from 0 to 1 can actually be. So this finishes up our discussion on properties of definite integrals. If you have any questions regarding the 8 or 10 basic properties of the definite integral, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about any of the examples, please let me know that as well. If you have any questions regarding the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about evaluating definite integrals that do not result from simple geometric formulas.